Hello Internet. Today I've got something very special for you. The Pentax Electrospotmatic, made by the Asahi Optical Company of Japan in 1971. And we will go through a complete reverse engineering and repair of the electronics of this camera. This camera model is so remarkable because it is the first or at least one of the very first 35 mm single lens reflex cameras released with fully automatic exposure control. Since this model was only sold in Japan and only for one year from 1971 to 1972, there's very little information available about it. And because of that, some people even call this camera unrepairable, which is a shame because as you will see, this camera has the potential to be one of the most repairable automatic cameras. Some people also wrongly believe this model to be the same as the later Pentax ES model. While from a user's perspective the Pentax Electrospotmatic and the Pentax ES are almost indistinguishable, there are important differences. The only user visible difference is that the polarity of the battery has been reversed, but this difference in polarity is only the tip of an iceberg of internal differences and these cameras are electronically very different from each other. What makes the Electrospotmatic so special is that it uses these beautiful hand-soldered circuit boards that are fully analog and contain only discrete components, no integrated circuits, unlike the later models. We actually have two of these cameras here and when we got them, neither of them was working. In the meantime, I have reverse engineered the electronics and I have already repaired one of these cameras, which is now working precisely enough to expose slide film, which has a relatively low tolerance for exposure error. In these videos, I want to share all the necessary information and together we will test and repair the second camera and make it hopefully work just as well as the first one. This video is dedicated to my father who is a lifelong Pentax enthusiast. He owns the cameras and he has also provided for the quite significant costs of this project. So thank you dad. As for official information about this camera I couldn't find much. I contacted Rico Imaging Support who now provides service for Pentax cameras and they replied that they had no documentation for this model. I also reached out to Eric Henriksen, a Pentax repair specialist who is well known on the Pentax forums. Eric kindly provided some service information for the ES and ES2 models, but he also had nothing pertaining to the Electrospotmatic. There's actually an interview with him out there in which he confirms that he cannot uh, provide service for the electronics of the Electrospotmatic. Looking for an owner's manual, I reached out to Mike and Lynn Butkus of OrphanCameras.com and they kindly provided a manual for the Pentax ES, but they also had nothing specific to the Electrospotmatic. The only truly official information I could find is in a US patent from 1973 and the description and the figures in this patent correspond rather closely to the circuits of this camera. However, there are also some differences between the schematics in the patent and the actual circuits. There are also differences between different revisions of the electronics of this camera. I found this patent rather late in my research unfortunately because there are so many different patents registered by the Asahi Optical Company during this period of time. From this we see that this was a period of very active research during which the Asahi engineers developed and registered many different ideas about how to realize a single lens reflex camera with automatic exposure control. Because there is so little information available, I will cram a lot of stuff I found out into these videos as a reference for people who want to work on the camera. If you just want to follow the repair, 
Simply skip the video chapters that are marked as reference information. You will find the following tools useful when working on this camera. A set of small JIS crosspoint screwdrivers. Don't use Philips screwdrivers because they will likely damage the small screws found on these cameras. This set also contains some tiny flathead screwdrivers which are useful for removing the housing of the frame counter. An adjustable spanner for unscrewing the exposure time wheel. A slotted screwdriver for unscrewing the slotted nut under the frame counter dial. And for adjustments inside this camera, I made myself this smaller slotted screwdriver, which fits the tiny lock nuts around the adjustment screws. In the following section, I will tell you a bit about the general construction and disassembly of this camera. Mechanically, the Electrospotmatic is very similar to earlier purely mechanical Spotmatic models, with two notable differences. First, it lacks the self-timer that would normally be located here on the other models. And second, if we look at the speed dial, we see that this camera lacks the slow mechanically controlled times. Slow meaning slower than the flash synchronization time of 1 60th of a second. The camera does retain the manual bulb setting though. The space otherwise occupied by the self-timer is here filled by a solenoid for controlling the shutter electronically and by a large battery compartment that is part of the front cover and comes out with the front cover that has been removed here to take this picture. What is not easily visible is that under the mirror box where otherwise you can find the gears that control the slow mechanical times this model has electrical contacts operated by the mirror action. We will talk about the function of these contacts later. This assembly works very similar to the disassembly of the earlier Spotmatic models about which you can already find nice videos on YouTube. I therefore will not repeat the whole procedure here, but instead I will link to such a video in the description. To get to the electronics board, you need to remove the bottom cover which is easily done by removing four screws, two larger ones on the outside and two smaller ones next to the tripod mount in the center. When you remove the bottom cover, take care not to lose the dust seal. With the bottom plate removed, you get to see the beautiful hand-soldered circuit board of this model. And five of the trimmers needed for calibration become immediately accessible from this side. To further take out the circuit board you need to remove two screws, this one being larger than the other. When you remove the circuit board also take care not to lose the isolating collar around the tripod mount. The circuit board is connected to the camera body by 11 cables attached to a 12-pin plug. If you want to get more play in the cables to be able to handle the board more easily, you can remove the retaining clamp that is holding down the cables. This is how the 12-pin connector looks. Probably somebody was already in there and had a tough time getting these, this connector apart. It's not too easy. You need to pry it apart with a very thin implement that you can insert here at the sides. And once you have it slightly apart, you can then walk the connector apart, which takes quite a lot of force to do. When removing this connector, it is almost inevitable to break some of the very thin and brittle cables. The problem is that the isolating sleeves that were put on in the factory are not shrink wrapped around the wires and they do nothing to take mechanical stress of the wires. The wire isolation 
ends right where the isolating sleeve begins and so you have this point where just a lot of stress is put on this, these very very thin and brittle wires when the plug is moved. For calibration you also need to remove the top cover of the camera. Before you remove the top cover take note of the setting of the ASA and exposure compensation dial. Once the cover has been removed you can find four of the calibration trimmers immediately on the right and there is a final trimmer hiding under the little circuit board for the battery test switch. This little circuit board needs to be removed in order to get to that trimmer. By the way, it is not necessary to remove the prism cover that has been removed for taking this picture. To get to the stop down calibration trimmer, you need to remove the little board with the battery test switch. Be careful not to lose the spacer here that will move freely as soon as the screw is removed. You can then lift the little circuit board up and you will find that the trimmer board is sandwiched between the battery test switch board and another third board that contains circuitry for the battery test and that you will normally not need to get to. Once you have gained access to the stop down trimmer, I recommend that you immediately reinstall the ASA and exposure compensation dial on the opened camera in the correct position because it, having this dial makes it much easier to operate the camera during calibration. You normally don't need to open the front cover of the camera in order to work on the electronics which is good because removing the front cover is not as easy on this model as it is in the mechanical Spotmatics. The front cover contains a potentiometer ring that senses the aperture set on the lens. This potentiometer is connected to the body of the camera with these very very thin wires that go to a distribution board. You first need to remove the top cover. I recommend that you desolder the color coded wires going to the body of the camera and then unscrew and remove this distribution board uh, because I think it, it, it is much less risky than uh, working on these extremely tiny wires are going to the potentiometer. When handling the front cover take care not to lose any of the washers that can come out of it. I also found a small metal plate that came out of one of the holes of this front cover. Of the five screws this one going here is different and smaller than the other four. For the new camera I decided to re-solder all the wires at the connector and put proper heat shrink on to hopefully prevent further breaking of wires. This fiddly connector is the electrical interface between the PCB and the camera body and is therefore also the main interface for diagnosis of the electronics. All the most important signals of the circuit are available at this connector. You will note that pin 1 is not connected to a wire and we'll see that pin 10 is not used on the PCB. All the other connections are important. It is just that when the PCB is mounted inside the camera, pin 12, the ground connection, is somewhat redundant because the PCB is also grounded by its mounting screws to the chassis. Since this connector is so important but difficult to work with, I designed a system of adapters and extension cables to give us more freedom to handle and probe the PCB. I also designed a breakout and test board 
for this system. I will now go ahead and mount the second camera to these adapters. If you are interested uh, in having such a board, please contact me because I still have spare boards available that I can send at cost. I will now mount the adapter board in place of the original PCB and I will use a sandbag so I can stand the camera on its top. The adapter plate is now properly mounted. So from this point on there should be no more mechanical stress on the connector and its tiny cables. Okay, that was a bit more fiddly than I would have liked. I had to place a second layer of rubber here to get proper pressure on the connector. Let's first check the ground connection. It should go to pin 12 on the breakout board and we test at camera chassis. Seems fine. And at the other end of the connector we will check pin 2. That is the switched battery voltage and it should connect to this point on the shutter release switch. Seems fine. At the other end we will plug this cable adapter into the connector on the PCB. I just need to align the pins very carefully so they do not go astray. I think all the pins are correctly aligned. So let's push the connector in. Yeah, that looks fine. Should have good connections. Now that I've got all the extension cables connected, the camera should work just as if the PCB was in the camera which in this case is of course it doesn't work because this camera has some problem but we can at least do some initial checks and for this we will install a battery in the camera you can use either uh, lithium batteries like this one or silver batteries the silver batteries have a nominal voltage of 6.2 volt the lithium is nominal 6 volt and both should work However, when I was checking the connections, I already discovered the first problem with this camera, namely that in the battery compartment, the positive contact spring was deformed such that under some circumstances it was touching the chassis and effectively shorting the battery out. And this took quite a toll of my nice silver battery here which was initially measuring as 6.3 volts and now it is measuring under 6 volts so we will be using the lithium battery until I get a new silver one. So let's put it in, positive inward and close the battery compartment. Well, it seems the battery is just not making reliable contact so Let's try using a fiber pen and some contact cleaner. To hopefully clean up this contact spring and make it work more reliably. Let's see if that made a difference. These battery compartments are so fiddly to get a thread started. Okay, that looks better. You see my board has power LEDs for testing two of the power rails in the camera. And 
when the camera is in automatic and I depress the shutter release, I now see that these power rails are powered, which was not working reliably before. So hopefully the contact has improved enough. Now that everything is connected, I can tell you a bit about the symptoms of this camera. If I release the shutter, you can hear that it always sounds like a very fast shutter time. No matter if there's a lot of light entering the camera or whether there's hardly any light entering the camera. So that's obviously a problem. I do see some reaction to the light. So if I point it directly into my video light, it indicates 1 over 250 second exposure time. And if I point it somewhere else, it indicates less. But the variation of the meter indication is much too little from pointing it directly into the video light to mostly covering the lens. It goes down from 1 over 250 seconds to 1 over 60 seconds way too little for this large difference in light. So something is not right with the light sensitivity of the camera. We will now start to systematically look for problems in this camera. And the first thing to check in any electronic device is always the power supply. The power supply concept of the Pentax Electrospotmatic is surprisingly elaborate and it accounts for about half of the circuitry in the camera and also for about half of the area used on the PCB. The supply circuitry comprises a DC-DC converter and three voltage regulators. Two of these regulators are at the output of the DC-DC converter and there's a third regulator that drops down directly from the switched battery voltage. At the input of the DC-DC converter we find a simple oscillator built from a single transistor that is connected to the middle tap primary winding of a tiny transformer. The transformer has two secondary windings. One of them goes to the regulator responsible for the main power rail of the circuit that is available on pin 7 and has a voltage that I called VREG. This voltage can be trimmed to about 6 volts. It can also be trimmed to a higher voltage, but I observed a rather high ripple whenever it is set to above 6 volts. So I think it should be at 6 volts or slightly below. The regulator itself has a straightforward topology and uses a Zena diode for its voltage reference. The other secondary winding goes to an even simpler regulator that consists only of a filter capacitor and a Zener diode. This regulator provides a floating voltage between pins 5 and 6 of about 7.8 volts. This voltage is used by a floating resistive divider that calculates the exposure depending on the film speed and aperture settings. The third regulator is independent from the DC-DC converter. It drops down directly from the switched battery voltage and provides a voltage V charge of about 2.6 volts that is used to charge the timing capacitor. This voltage is also adjustable by a trimming potentiometer and we will talk about adjusting the V rack and V charge voltages later when we talk about the full calibration procedure for the camera. In the board revision we are looking at here, the V-charge regulator uses the forward voltage of a diode with two PN junctions as its voltage reference. Let's now look at the operation of the DC-DC converter in more detail. The basic topology is that of a flyback converter with respect to the V-float output. If for now we ignore the other secondary winding going to the VREG regulator. This flyback 
converter is run in discontinuous current mode as a quasi-resonant converter. In the upper right, we see the waveforms at the primary side of the converter. Orange is the switched battery voltage that stays roughly constant at here about 5.4 volts. We just see some small variations depending on the loading of the battery. Yellow is at the collector of the switching transistor and green is on the other side of this middle tap primary winding and is used as the feedback signal going back to the base of the switching transistor via a current limiting resistor. On the secondary side we see the typical waveforms of a flyback converter here in this lower right scope screenshot. Note that for this capture the scope was grounded to camera chassis which is not ideal for looking at the signals on this secondary side since the V-float voltage is basically a floating voltage that is referenced to ground only very indirectly through the camera wiring and the resistive dividers in the camera. We see that with respect to the high frequency components we do not have a good ground reference here. Only in the differential signal that shows the difference between the pink and the gray potential we see a cleaner flyback waveform. To get a clearer picture I took another screenshot with the scope grounded to pin 6 and here we now also see the AC ripple on the V-float voltage in blue. Note that this is shown on a very different vertical scale being magnified 250 times with respect to the other signals at 20 millivolts per division. To understand the behavior of the flyback converter it is best to divide its operation period into three separate phases. Let's start with the magnetization phase which is the phase during which the switching transistor is conductive. During this phase there is a linearly rising current going through the primary winding that builds up a magnetic field in the transformer. The secondary winding is effectively open because the diode D7 is reverse biased during this phase. And if we for now ignore the other secondary winding, the primary winding just acts as a simple inductance. Electrical energy is converted into energy stored in the magnetic field inside the transformer. I have dimmed the part of the winding going to the green connection here because due to the high resistive value here there are only very small currents flowing through this winding. And therefore this winding does not directly influence the main inductance seen here very much. Magnetization ends when the magnetic field can no longer increase. This causes a change in the induced voltages and we see that the yellow terminal moves upwards while the green terminal moves down in voltage which eventually lowers the base of the transistor enough to turn off the transistor and we enter the next phase. Now that the transistor is turned off we are in the demagnetization phase in which the magnetic field decreases. This induces a voltage in the secondary winding that forward biases the diode and now current can flow through the secondary winding and energy is transferred from the magnetic field to the filter capacitor. Diode D5 in the VREC regulator is now reverse biased making the other secondary winding appear open so it cannot contribute during this phase. You might think that also the primary side 
cannot contribute because the transistor is basically acting as an open circuit. However, the parasitic capacitance between the collector and the emitter forms a resonant circuit on the primary side with the leakage inductance. The leakage inductance is created by that part of the primary winding that does not share its magnetic field lines with the secondary winding. Since the leakage inductance is relatively small, this resonant circuit has a high resonant frequency that creates this high frequency ringing that we see on the primary side in the demagnetization phase. We also see a tiny remainder of this high frequency ringing being transferred to the secondary side, but note the vertical scale here that is only 20 millivolts per division for the blue trace. The demagnetization phase ends when all of the energy stored in the magnetic field has been transferred elsewhere. This causes the induced voltage on the secondary winding to drop and once this voltage drops below the voltage across the filter capacitor, diode D7 becomes reverse biased and the secondary winding is again open and can no longer contribute. Now we are in the resonant phase where both of the diodes on the secondary side are reverse biased and the whole transformer basically appears as a single large primary inductance LP plus the leakage inductance. Together with the capacitance across the still switched off transistor. This creates a resonant circuit on the primary side now with a much larger inductance and therefore a much lower resonant frequency. We can only see the beginning of an oscillation here however. If it weren't for other reasons we would now see a low frequency damped oscillation starting here. As soon as the yellow terminal has moved down in voltage enough and correspondingly the green terminal has moved up in voltage enough. The green terminal via resistor R13 turns on the transistor again and we enter the next magnetization phase. We now understand the periodic behavior of the flyback converter generating the V-float voltage. But what about the other secondary winding and the VREC regulator. Well, that is the less conventional part of this circuit and I couldn't really find references online for this kind of topology. What happens here is that the Pentax engineers use this other secondary winding to generate a bit of a voltage boost up from the switched battery voltage. This secondary winding is in phase with the primary opposed to the direction of the flyback winding responsible for V float. This causes the diode D5 to be forward biased during the magnetization phase as opposed to diode D7 that is forward biased during demagnetization. This secondary winding apparently has fewer turns than the other windings, which is also reflected in a lower DC resistance that I measured across it. During the magnetization phase, when we have a voltage of about 5 volts from the orange to the yellow terminal, we have a voltage of the same polarity but a smaller magnitude from white to orange. So here we see we have about 3 volts from white to orange. However, this voltage is added on top of the switched battery voltage connected to orange and so with reference to ground the white terminal reaches about plus 8 volts during the magnetization phase. This 
forward biases diode D5 and so the filter capacitor C3 can be charged up to this voltage of about 8 to almost 9 volts. We then have a voltage regulator that drops this voltage down to a stable supply voltage on pin 7 that is regulated to about 6 volts. So what all of this circuitry in the Pentax Electrospotmatic achieves is that even if the battery voltage is significantly below the nominal 6 volts, say as low as 5 volts, we still get stable supply voltages of about 6 volts on pin 7 with reference to ground and of about 7.8 volts on pin 5 with respect to pin 6. And these voltages are almost independent from the battery voltage within a certain range. Let's finally take a look at the ripple that we see on the VREC voltage on pin 7. It is shown here with the blue trace and the vertical resolution is um, extremely magnified by 1000 times relative to the other traces at 5 millivolts per division. Now that we have an overview of the supply concept, let's make some practical checks of the wiring and the switches in the camera body. The first switch that the battery positive uh, goes through is the automatic switch that is uh, connected to the shutter speed dial. So only when the shutter speed dial is in automatic mode, only then is the battery positive connected to further parts of the circuit, even including the battery check. The battery check is only functional if the camera is switched to automatic. Otherwise, the battery is completely disconnected, which is useful if you either want to preserve battery or also if the camera gets electronically stuck with an open shutter and, and the mirror lifted. If this happens to you, you just need to turn the shutter dial out of automatic mode and the camera will immediately close the, the shutter because the solenoid that keeps the shutter open is no longer powered when you switch the camera out of automatic mode. Let's check if the battery check does something. If I depress it, yeah, it, it works perfectly. The indicator of the meter immediately moves up um, into the, the notch at the side that is opposite the 1 over 30 second mark. So that's the expected operation of the battery check. As soon as we have the camera in automatic, we should see the battery voltage on the input of the shutter release switch. I have clamped the common lead of my multimeter to ground. So here we should see about 6 volts and we do. And you will see if I now switch the camera out of automatic mode, this voltage does not immediately go away. And the reason for this is that there is a filter capacitor close to this switch here and it discharges only very slowly now. If I depress the shutter to actually energize the circuit, you will see that the discharge becomes much faster. And of course, if the solenoid is, would be active, the discharge would be very, very quick. So now we are at the low voltage and if I switch the camera back to automatic, we immediately see the full battery voltage again. Uh, the second switch the battery power goes through is the shutter release operated switch here at the bottom of the camera. So if I go to the other side of the switch, we don't see any voltage now, but if I depress the shutter release halfway, we see that it goes up to almost the full battery voltage. I check the switch again and actually the voltage drop that we noticed 
is an actual voltage drop that also is propagated to the input of the switch. As soon as we power the circuit, the voltage drops to about 5.37 volts. And this is exactly what we see on the other side of the switch. So the switch is actually fine. It does not add too much contact resistance. It's just that the internal resistance of the battery causes this drop as soon as the circuit draws some current. In parallel to the shutter release switch, there is actually a second path that can power the electronics. And this path goes from the uh, input of the shutter release switch to an electric contact under the mirror box and the switch is closed when the mirror uh, lifts upwards and it keeps the switch closed and thereby the circuit powered as long as the mirror is up so even if the user releases the shutter button. This is so that the electronics can do long exposures like one second even when the user does not depress shutter release button for all of this time. And we will now test this contact. It's a bit difficult to check to separate its, its action from the shutter release switch. I have the camera in bulb mode now, so the battery is not connected to the circuitry. We can, however, open the shutter for as long as we want using bulb mode. I will connect this cable release. I will first depress the shutter only halfway and fix it in this position. I have connected the common lead of my multimeter to pin 2. We should see that, that pin 2 is connected to the input of the shutter release by the release switch. I will now demonstrate that I can open the release switch by uh, pressing on this little spring here. So let's first show that it's closed. I'm now holding down the spring and thereby opening the shutter release switch. Okay, so now I have verified that I can really open the shutter release switch in this way. And now I will um, open the shutter in bulb mode. So let's, let's release and I fix the shutter in this position. So the mirror is up. Now, of course, we, we have connectivity here just because the shutter release button is depressed, but we should have now connectivity even when I open the shutter release switch. And indeed we have, so I'm pressing down here And we have connectivity from the input of the shutter release switch, which is, which is in automatic mode connected to the battery plus to pin two. There is another power supply contact that is operated by the mirror action. And it is a switch for providing power to the solenoid that is only activated when the mirror is up. I have connected my multimeter probes to pin 2 and pin 10. And we are checking connectivity between pin 2, which is the switched battery supply, and pin 10, which is the positive side of the solenoid. And you see that just depressing the shutter lightly, which closes the shutter release switch, is not enough to get continuity here. but now we are in, in bulb mode. If I make the mirror go up, 
we have connectivity between pin 2 and pin 10 exactly as long as the mirror is up. So this switch is working and we know that it can power the solenoid while the mirror is up. Now it's time to take some actual measurements of the voltage rails. I have the camera back in automatic mode. So as soon as I depress the shutter lightly, the circuitry should be powered. So first let's check the switched battery input. When I depress the shutter button, it goes to about 5.4 volts. So the switch is working. Let's go to the main power supply rail of the circuit that is pin 7. I'm measuring now between pin 7 and ground. And as soon as I depress the shutter, we see a voltage of 5.86 volts, which is per perfectly fine. The next supply rail that we will check we will check indirectly by measuring between pin 1 and ground. And this is a separate voltage regulator that we are checking now that supplies the voltage for charging the timing capacitor. And it should be somewhere around 2.5 volts. So I hold the, the shutter release down and we see 2.64 volts, which Seems absolutely fine. And now we will check the, the floating voltage regulator. We will check it between pins 5 and 6. And this should be around 7.5 volts. That's 7.784. So that's fine. It's not so important what precisely this voltage is. It needs to be in a certain range, but um, the most important thing is that it is absolutely stable. Power rails look fine. So let's give our little power supplies a bit of a workout. I have now replaced the battery with my benchtop power supply so we can vary the battery input voltage that we see on the yellow multimeter. It's currently set to about 6 volts. The red multimeter will show us the uh, average DC voltage on the power rail and also the AC component, which should of course be as close to zero as possible. And we will use this nice oscilloscope that is actually almost as old as the camera uh, to look for ripple um, and switching activity. I will have to switch off the video lights now so that you can see the trace better. I hope you can see all the instruments. So I'm connected with the oscilloscope and the red multimeter. I'm connected to power rail 7 with reference to ground. And let's see how well our regulator is doing. I will now depress the shutter release button. Voltage went up. We see an average DC voltage of 5.877 and the AC component is very small. So here we see 0.01 volts, but let's look more closely on the oscilloscope. I have it set to 1 volt by division and we don't see any ripple at all, which is good, but let's now Switch to AC coupling. Let's raise the resolution, the vertical resolution. And here now we see we are now at 5 millivolts per division. And we very clearly see some ripple caused by the switching activity of the DC-DC converter. What we see here is um, a frequency of 10 kilohertz. I have the time resolution set to 20 microseconds per division and one period is quite exactly five divisions long. 
And as for the amplitude, we see some quite extreme spikes uh, when it is switching. I don't know. I hope you can see this uh, on the video. And let's see, we have including the spikes 35 millivolts peak to peak. Should be absolutely fine. We just see that what looked like DC with a low resolution really has quite a lot of high frequency activity. They normally don't cause a problem because the rest of the circuit has some, let's say, natural low pass filtering and does not care about these high frequency components. Let's now look at pin one, our indirect way at uh, looking at the V charge regulator. So I moved the both the multimeter and the oscilloscope over. Uh, multimeter shows 2.6629 volts and the AC component again very very low 0 0.002 volts. Um, however we see on the oscilloscope that we have quite um, distinct switching activity being visible here. Let's see, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, six and a half in 20 millivolt per division. So 130 millivolts peak to peak. That's quite a lot, but still these are high frequency components. So let's go down to, to lower frequencies and we see that there's um, nothing in addition to these 10 kilohertz uh, components that could cause a problem. So only this 10 kilohertz stuff that as we will see should normally not cause any problems. We will now move to the floating supply. I will connect the ground of the oscilloscope to pin 6 um, and probe to pin 5 and the red multimeter also from pin 5 to pin 6. DC component is 7.797 volts again with low AC component. And again we have I would say about 130 millivolts peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of this switching garbage coming through. And nothing noticeable at lower frequencies, which is important. Now let's check uh, the dependency of the voltage regulator output voltage on the input voltage. We will check how far down we can go with the simulated battery voltage. Currently we are at an input voltage of about 6 volts and we are getting 5.882 volts output. I can also activate an additional 10k ohms load resistor here. Okay, With that additional load we have 5.879 volts and without the load 5.879. So the regulator is doing what it should, regulating. Let's now start to drop the input voltage. Okay, this was the upwards direction, so we are now at 6.3 volt, which is what a very new silver battery would have, 5.890. We do see some modified triggering on the scope, but I think that's not too meaningful. Let's go in the downward direction. We are now at 5 volts input and the output is still at 
looking good. Additional load does not make a lot of difference. Let's drop further. Four pound five volts input voltage and we start to see a bit of a drop in the regulated output somewhat above 4.5 we were still seeing an almost unmodified output voltage but now it's starting to drop a bit 5.73 at 4 volts we still get 5.23 output but this is now a significant difference from the normal regulated voltage at 5.88 that we could say that the camera would definitely not operate normally with a 4 volt battery as long as the battery is uh, let's say close to 5 volt let's say 4.8 volts, we see an absolutely usable output voltage. There is definitely a change in, in the ripple here. Okay, we, see, we are now below 5 volts, so 4.9 volts. Our ripple is still looking fine as we go down further we we start to see some definite ripple appear at let's say 4.6 volts the ripple is about 0.5 of a uh, volt but you see that Below 5 volts, the quality of the output of the regulator certainly degrades. But um, until about 5 volts, it is doing, doing just fine. So about at this point, it, it starts to work perfectly. Yeah, everything, everything above 4.9 seems to be fine with this current load situation dropping in the additional load. Yeah, we see a little bit of increase of the ripple here with more load. So here it starts to make a small difference below 5 volts. So load is gone again. For completeness, let's also look at pin 1. Seems to be just fine with 4.9 volts input actually works even farther down so that's not the limiting factor let's also check the floating supply between pins 6 and 5 7.784 this is 5 volt input let's go back to 6 volts input 7.792 let's see how it behaves below 5 volts yeah just fine we also don't see a lot of additional ripple which is also expected because as you will see this floating supply between pins 5 and 6 is only very lightly loaded so we don't see the drops like we see on the main power rail when we go down in input voltage. Everything about the voltage regulators looks just fine as long as the battery voltage is at least 5 volts or so. That concludes our diagnosis of the power supply system. So I think we can say that apart from these small contact problems that I had with the contact spring in the battery compartment, the power supply circuit of this camera is just completely fine. Well, not so fast. The different ripple waveforms bothered me and I really wanted to understand where they are coming from. I finally managed to build an LT-SPICE simulation that at least qualitatively reproduces what we see in the actual circuit.
Let's go from least to most surprising. The most straightforward ripple is the one we see on the V-float voltage. It is simply the result of connecting the flyback winding directly to the filter cup and the Sina diode. The Sina diode is just a bad voltage regulator and the ripple of 130 millivolts peak to peak is the result. This regulator is actually very lightly loaded by a purely resistive load of about 26 kilo ohms. However, it is inefficient because most of the current goes through the Sina diode instead of through the load and most of the energy is dissipated as heat at the Sina diode. Still, the V-float ripple does not bother me at all because if we look at the bigger picture, the V-float voltage goes through an effective low-pass filter formed by the resistive dividers around the film speed setting and the storage capacitor. Because the cutoff frequency of this low-pass filter is far below 10 kHz, we should only see a very small remainder of the V-float ripple entering the remaining parts of the circuit. Next is the V-reg ripple. As far as I can tell, the V-reg regulator is doing quite a good job and the ripple is not its fault. The only explanation I could find for this almost square wave shaped ripple is that it is caused by return currents through the rather long cables of our test harness causing a shift in the ground potential. Therefore, the true V-Rack ripple should be much lower when the PCB is mounted in the camera chassis. But even with the 20 to 30 millivolts peak to peak that we see with the test harness, this ripple should not cause any problems in the circuit. As we have seen, V-Rack only becomes problematic when the battery voltage drops too low because the voltage boost provided by this secondary winding piggybacking on the flyback converter is quite weak. And when the battery voltage drops below about 5 volts, we start to see the signature of an insufficiently charged filter capacitor. And there's nothing the voltage regulator can do about that. The most confusing ripple is the one we see on V-charge because the transients have the opposite polarity of what most reasonable explanations would predict. The only explanation I could find is that this ripple is the result of some unwanted capacitive coupling on the circuit board. If we look at the routing of the flyback secondary, we find a very long trace on the top of the circuit board that crosses more than half the length of the circuit board. And if you look on the bottom of the circuit board, we see that this trace on the top goes right behind the V-charge regulator. In particular, it crosses right behind the base of one of the regulating transistors. And my suspicion is that it is a capacitive coupling to the base of this transistor that causes this strange ripple that we see on V-charge. Overall, I think that the routing of the PCB was driven more by the very tight space constraints in the camera than by concerns about signal integrity. You might ask whether we have any evidence that capacitive coupling is the problem here. And I think the answer is yes, because when we look at the waveforms on the secondary side of the flyback, we see that the positive side of the secondary looks a bit low pass filtered. And we see correspondingly that the negative side has these high frequency uh, peaks. In my opinion, these are signs that uh, the high frequency components find some path to ground. And this path could be exactly the one capacitively coupling to the base of the V-charge regulating transistor.
The spikes on recharge bother me much more than all the other forms of ripple we found, because when the camera is operating the shutter, the recharge voltage couples capacitively directly into the most important signal in the whole circuit, the signal that defines the timing of the exposure. In the follow-up parts to this video, we will see whether the ripple causes any problem there. If the ripple is a problem, can we do something about it? Well, we certainly cannot reroute the PCB. However, in contrast to the other regulators, the V-Charge regulator actually has a filter cap at its output. Unfortunately, this filter cap is not doing much to reduce the ripple here, because I measured this cap to have an equivalent series resistance of horrible 50 ohms. That is certainly not helping. I did not recap the board because I want to replace as few of the original components as possible. But if the VCharge Ripple proves a problem, we have the option of installing a modern cap with low ESR in parallel to this filter cap. And my experiments suggest that this could reduce the VCharge Ripple at least by a factor of 2 to 4. To conclude our inspection of the power supply, I will now show you some live probing of the signals of the DC-DC converter. The collector of this transistor, which is um, connected to the yellow wire going to the transformer. And we see the switching activity with quite a large amplitude. So I think if we ignore the, the switching spike, I see about three divisions. So that is 15 volts amplitude. Scope is set to five volts per division and 20 micro seconds per division. The green wire comes from the feedback winding. So I'm probing now at green. Uh, we see an inverted waveform. Now we are at the base of the transistor. And we see that the, the base does not vary a lot because it has the, the base emitter diode limiting the voltage. If you look at the output of the transformer, here is the pink wire output. So this is also yeah, not quite three divisions, it's two and a half divisions. So that's 12.5 volts amplitude. The white output and the gray. The DC-DC converter is working fine, just like the rest of the power supply circuitry. So we can conclude that all power supply stuff is fine. We will now proceed to look at the light sensitive part of the circuit, but we will do that in the next part of the video. See you then.